Father, Lord, I thank you, God, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, you, um, you continue, Lord, to bless us and uh, use us in spite of our uh, failings and frailties and ups and downs. And God, you're a blessing, loving, generous God. And Lord, we thank you. Um, help us, God, to to dig in, Lord, to see a bit of you. Lord, help me to get out of the way. God, to not have an agenda, but Lord, to, to draw us each to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. We are going to be... going to start in chapter 14, or excuse me, verse 14, <laughs> but you're wondering how we we're going to do 13 and 14 at the same time. All right, um, 13, okay, and 13, verse 13 ends with John departing from them, talking about John Mark returning to Jerusalem, he, John Mark departing from uh, what is now being described as Paul and his party. It's no longer Barnabas and Paul, it's Paul and his party. Um, so there's been some sense of a leadership t change. Uh, we talked about that with, you know, you know, whether or not that was the later on rift that came out of out of this John John Mark leaving between Paul and Barnabas that the Lord used to spread the ministry further, but that it's not really our place necessarily to say this guy was wrong or this guy was wrong. They they had two perspectives, and the Lord led them in different directions from those two perspectives. Um, but for for a moment, I want to just kind of jump into a quick life lesson, honestly, of of um, to have grace when a brother or sister str struggles remember that you tend to be blind to your own weakness and need that same grace from others I think it's really easy I find it really easy to look at other people's lives and see where they're weak or struggle, struggle or they have a pride issue here or they have but I like to cover those up in my own. I mean, those those are just kind of, eh, I don't want to see those in me. So uh, we need to be careful with that. We need to be careful to make sure that we are honest with ourselves about ourselves and also grace, graceful and grace, gracious, not graceful, gracious to others. You should be graceful too, your little pirouettes and your whatnot, but be uh, gracious to our brothers and sisters who, who are struggling when they, when they fall. Uh, Galatians 6 uh, says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I think we saw that in, in Barnabas, how he restored. He, he restored John Mark to ministry. Who knows what would have happened if Barnabas hadn't had that soft heart towards his nephew. He was... He restored him to ministry, uh, even when he left him high and dry. We have no idea what what the circumstances. We don't have have that here. Whether he just he didn't like Paul, whether uh, he just got tired of the ministry, whether he got scared after you know people kicked him out of Paphos or didn't like didn't like him in the uh, in Paphos or we don't know. But without Barnabas, would he ever have been restored? With that with that soft heart of restoration, would he have ever been? Uh, restored hard to tell let's jump into verse 14 if I can find it in my Bible verse 14 but when they departed from Perga they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers 
of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, and said, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. First, we have an interesting Paul following his own, uh, what he's laid out in Romans, what obviously the Lord has given him, that he should go to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Romans uh, 1.16 is, um, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. And he this was called Paul's kind of modus operandi. He would he would go to a new place, he would find the the synagogue there, and he'd go there and he'd you know generally wait for an opportunity to speak. He'd wait wait until there was a chance to speak and he'd bring up Christ and he showed Christ with everybody and, and then generally that stirred up a mess and they'd kick him out of there and, and he, then he would go, <laughs> then he would go and tell tell the Gentiles and, and it it was in that repeated thing that he was going to the Jews first, but the obvious thing was that God had called him to be effective in ministry towards uh, Gentiles. His ministry wasn't towards the Jews, though he went and obeyed, but he was, the Lord was in, and the Lord con- continued to bless, even through us today, his, his ministry to the Gentiles. Um, and look at here who he's, inv- he's uh, speaking to. Those who are, are called in one sense or another. He's, he stood up, motioning them with his hands. He's apparently uh, Italian or something. Got the hand motion going on. Hey, hey, listen up here. Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. Those are those who are called. And um, I guess that's the... The question I had is, is, do you fear God? Do you, do you, or you guys are, I don't believe any of you are men of Israel. So therefore, do you fall in the other category? Do you, do you fear God? And that's a, I think we often have a mistaken notion of that fearing God within the Christian church, at least the American Christian church of, of, oh, it's just reverence, like our happy, loving father. And we, we should have reverence for God, but there should be a true, healthy sense of fear. Not, not, it, it doesn't. I was having this conversation with my kids this week about fearing God. It only makes sense that if we have a right perspective of who God is, we will fear God. Just out of natural self-preservation, natural, yeah, I just like the, the example I gave my kids, if there was a lion roaming around outside, you wouldn't have to, mm, I have reverence for the lion. No, you would fear that lion, and you would fear for your life. And but God is so much more powerful, so much more awesome, so much greater than any lion, than any anything that we can even wrap our mind around to be afraid of. It only makes sense that we would fear the Lord. And yet, do we live that way? Do we live? Uh, we don't as as His kids, who's He's adopt, who, whom He has adopted. We don't have to walk in a state of, because he's had grace toward us. But we should still, there should be a healthy fear of our, of our God. The fact that who he is should, should steer us towards obedience to him rather than who this person in front of us is, whether or not, you know, we, we might feel strange in front of them or embarrassed about what we're going to say or, or whatever they might do to us, right? So, um it kind of brings me, if you think of a couple examples in scriptures of, of men who, who got a glimpse. Isaiah 6, 5. I, uh, so I said, woe to me, for I am undone. That idea is just kind of a, just a falling apart at the seams. I am undone. I just it fell down when he got a glimpse of the Lord. Because I am a man of unclean lips. He immediately recognized his sin immediately recognized there was uh, ugliness in him. In Revelation one seven, John, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is the Apostle John. I mean, he's he's 
He's professional Christian, way up here on the way up here on the Christian scale. We're down here, semi-pro, you know, high school. <laughs> this is professional Christian, and he just fell apart. He just fell down as though dead when he saw the Lord. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna run through. Fear of the Lord is not is a blessing. If you, if you read through Scripture, you do a study on the fear of the Lord, and we get, our, we get a right perspective of who God's it, God is, it, it leads to nothing but blessing over and over if you read through Scripture. So I'm going to run through a bunch of, bunch of uh, verses. If you have a pen and paper, you might want to read them down. These are I was blessed when I ran across these. So we're going to start with some obvious ones that we hear all the time. Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If we don't fear the Lord, we, we can't even step up to the plate to begin to understand life, to begin to understand salvation. We must first fear the Lord. Okay, I was a ro- roll through these. Psalms thirty-one, nineteen. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. Psalm sixty-seven, four. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously, and govern the nations of the earth. I'm going to read that whole chapter. Actually, I've. I got to put that note in my scripture. Psalm 67. It's not, not in my scripture, in my notes. I'm calling my notes scripture now. Oh, run. Psalm 67. God is merciful to us. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way be, may be known on the earth, your salvation among all all nations let the people praise you O god let all the people praise you let all the nations be glad and sing for joy for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth let the peoples praise you O god let all the peoples praise you then the earth shall yield your increase god our own god shall bless us god shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him Psalm one twelve one. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Psalm one fifteen thirteen. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both great and small. Psalm one twenty eight one through four. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around you, your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Proverbs ten twenty seven. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Proverbs 19.23 The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited by evil. Proverbs 22.4 By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 28.14 Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Behold, Psalms 33, 18 through 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 85, 9. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that that glory may dwell in our land. Psalm 145.19, He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He also will hear their cry and save them. Nehemiah 1.11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants whose desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day 
I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I find that interesting how your servants who desire to fear your name. If I'm honest, that's, this is not, you know, I don't, I don't obviously walk in this perfectly in the, in the perfect sense of fearing the Lord above man, fearing the Lord above uh, many other things. Do, do you desire that, dude? Do you desire to have that? Do you pray that the Lord would, um, would know, not only give you that desire, but that you can walk in that fear? As you can see, there's many blessings. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His mercy. Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Ecclesiastes 8, 12-13. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear the Lord, who fear before Him. For it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Luke one fifty, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Psalm twenty five twelve, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. Ecclesiastes seven eighteen, it is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other for he who fears God will escape them all. Isaiah 33, six wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Psalm 103, 11 for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Psalm 64, you have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Selah. Psalm 115, 11, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Tying together fearing the Lord with trusting the Lord. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge, refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Malachi three sixteen and 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Zephaniah 3, 7. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling will not be cut off, despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. Malachi 4, 2. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calf. <laughs> Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations are, were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should judge, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and shall destroy those who destroy the earth. Psalm thirty four nine. O fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Psalm one eleven five. It was it has given food excuse me he has given food to those who fear him he will ever be mindful of his covenant that's certainly not all of them in scripture that's a good handful of the scriptures of fearing the lord and that's nearly every single one is tied to blessing nearly every single one when we when we have a right perspective of our father a right perspective of god and who he is and his greatness it leads us not only to worship Him, not only to seek Him, not only to trust Him, but also to shy away from disobedience, to also shy away from sin that we, um, just, just as with our children, a spanking sometimes is what they don't want to stop doing sin. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, it's the fear sometimes that keeps us uh, from sin, proper fear. Be afraid.
be very afraid. Verse 17. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip through to 39 here. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel choose our fathers and exalt the people and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Put up with their ways in the wilderness. The interesting way to put that. As a, the, it's a Jewish idiom from what I, what I understand. It's actually, it's also the same term that a mother feeding her baby. So it's a, there's a gentleness there of, you know, the baby's eating and spitting stuff out and, and making a mess and throwing food across the yard and, or across the kitchen. But it's also the idea of a father. <laughs> Come on. Come on. So it's, it's kind of a two-sided of this, this putting up with is the gentle side and also the, the come on, let's go and do better side. Um, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And after they asked for a king... And afterward, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David, a king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. For this man's seeds, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of, whom, whom, of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and the rulers, because he did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is written in the second palm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Did I say palm? Psalm. <laughs> Second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David. And therefore he also says in another Psalm, you will, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And so I'm going to let the history stand on its own that, that Paul pulled out here. There's that's way more than I can cover in a couple couple minutes here. So let that stand. Uh, talk about justification for a minute. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Um, 
justification, I've heard it called many times, justified never. Is a, is a, it's a good way to remember it. Um, and, it's, and it's true as, as the Lord sees us, He sees us once we have been forgiven, once we've been converted, we've placed our trust in, in Christ. He sees us not as broken, not as sinners. Not, he sees us just as though we have never sinned. He sees the righteousness of Christ. But it's, but it's better than that. And I think if, if, if we look at justification just as that, which is good, it's good that we, we are, have a clean slate and there's nothing on our record. But it's even better when we think it's that even though I did, I stand perfect. Even though I did, I stand perfect. And also that we, that not just our, it's just, just as though I never did, but these sins were paid for. And, and it's, and it's key to remember what Christ did. These sins, they weren't just wiped away and swept under a door and uh, it's just like you never did it. They were paid for. Every single one of our sins were paid for on the cross. Um, and so it's important for us to remember that our justification, uh, isn't just a wiping away, but there was a, a legal transaction that happened. There was a debt to be paid, and Jesus paid it. And there's the other side of justification, our self-justification, that we have a tendency of how do we, how do we j- tend to justify our own, own actions, and we all do sometimes in, in some ways, is, is we blame shift. I did this because they, right? Um, or... Huh? Yes, <laughs> he blamed, she blamed, shifted, he blamed, shifted, everybody is. <laughs> Try to, uh, uh, right. <laughs> this woman <laughs> that you gave me. <laughs> yep, yep. And so that's, that's a deal. And so it's, as we see, that's a part, that's a part of our fallen nature from the very, very, very early on. Part of our nature is to, ooh, the, 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 the view has gone to me. How can I get it off of me? So we, the, the blame shifting, uh, I did this because something happened to me. My father treated me poorly. I was X, Y happened in my, or because so-and-so did this, I reacted this way. And this is, you know, obviously raising kids is a, it's blatant and out there of how, well, he did that, so I hit him. Okay, but we, we're a little, we're a little sneakier about how we, how we, how we do it. But we do it nonetheless, and so um, be aware of it. Deflection also is a is a way that we try to justify ourselves. As you know, the the, the looking at somebody, looking at you. Uh, there's there's sin brought up. Oh, but look at their sin. Not necessarily I did it because of them, but yeah, but they're doing that. Look at that over there. That's terrible. Phew. Not looking at me anymore. You know, as a it's the idea of. Get your eyes somewhere else but me. I don't want to talk about me. But pastor said, but pastor did. But, you know, you, you think of the idea of that you know, people, a lot of people don't want to, don't want to, Christians, claim to be Christians, I want to go to church because some pastor did X, Y, Z in their past or whatever, right? And that's understandable and unfortunate that, that, that we have pastors that are sinners. How dare they be? But the, re- the reality is, is that that's a, that's a deflection of, we, and we have a similar deflection that we, I guarantee each one of us in here at times have the at least temptation to deflect, deflect in order to justify our, ourself. Um, life lesson, when we try to justify ourselves, we lie to ourselves and we keep our guilt. When we allow God, there's two there. To justify us, we are able to be honest and accept our sin and also be freed from guilt. Okay. Okay, when we try to justify ourselves, we lie to ourselves and keep our guilt. When we allow God to justify us, we are able to be honest and accept our sin and also be freed from guilt. Okay, 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, 
marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though you, though one were to declare it to you. Um, are you recognizing the work the Lord is doing in front of you? Are you seeing what He's doing in your own heart, in your own family, in your own life, in the lives of those around you, in this fellowship? Or do we scoff or despise or not believe? Or I think there's a, we have a tendency. And this is not a, an obviously direct application of this. This is talking about not believing in the gospel that was revealed. But, but we do. We have a tendency to not believe uh, the work the Lord is doing around us. Have, having a, a scoffing heart or a despising heart that, that for whatever reason we don't want to believe. Verse 42 and 43. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Those who were open to hear more, they sought them out. And We're going to have these opportunities in life that... that we may have a public setting where we have a chance to share at a public setting. But there will be those that will come to us who are interested. And we need to be aware of, of discerning those open doors. Discerning. Paul didn't have to run up to somebody and beat them down here and say, you, you better believe. He shared. Those who were open, the, the, those the Lord was opening that door for them, they came. And, and Paul was able to share. Um, so we don't have to we don't have to beat down doors. We take the opportunities we have and then we and then we discern when the Lord brings those who are open. Verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of the Lord. It's interesting how it spread here is that that they came um, they were invited just to, to speak about what, what they knew, what they heard, what they'd seen in Jesus, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And, they, and people were excited about that news. People wanted to hear that news. They wanted to hear about Jesus. And I think we need to be, be careful when we get, when talking to our friends about the Lord, when we get too far outside of Scripture. We obviously, but, but share actual Scripture. You know, with, with our with your friends when you're share, sharing with them, uh, when you have opportunities, um, make sure there's lots of scripture involved because God's God's word does not go void. Everything else that comes out of our mouth eh, may or may not have much much traction, but God's word will do what it's sent forth to do. Um, Life, life lessons, share scripture with friends whenever you can. The word of God does not return without accomplishing something. Our words, no matter how elegant, can absolutely be devoid of any value. Share scripture with friends whenever you can. The word of God does not return without accomplishing something. Our words, no matter how elegant, can absolutely, can absolutely be devoid of any value. This section of scripture, verse 13, actually has an interesting thing. It says uh, the phrase, the word of God, the word of the Lord, teaching of the Lord. That, that phrase, it's, I was looking through, noticing it was here several times. Turns out it's in this, this chapter seven times. The word of God. There's much, much to do about the word. Much, much to do about people respond, responding and wanting, desiring the word of God. And I think that's important for us to remember that that when when we exalt Jesus, when we exalt the word of God, that'll draw people to that. If as long as we're um, we don't have our own pet little uh, 
churchianity ideas of what uh, uh, things that we share of you can't dance, you can't drink, you can't, all these other things that we tend to build around Christ, but we're talking instead about Christ and talking instead sharing his words as actual words. People are, people tend to be drawn to that. Um, Verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Why would the people of the book, the Jews, not want people to hear the word of God? Why would that be? As I think it's the thing that jumps out is just envy. Just a, here were the, the, the people who had the control, people who had influence and all of us and they were drawing a minor a minor crowd we know that but here come Paul and Barnabas and all of a sudden there's a the entire island comes the everybody around comes to hear the next Sabbath right and so they're like whoa whoa that was okay when we had just a few people here but no <laughs> I'm not a big fan of that same, and same point that I've made before we need to be careful of envy we need to be careful of when somebody else is successful we have a tendency to look at, then be hypercritical of them and look for reasons that we can, well, meh, well, mm. be careful, be careful. Verse 46 and 47. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. They're, here they are recognizing that calling. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Harkening back to Acts 1.8, right? Um, interestingly, when I've had conversation with, with Jews about Christ and different things, that one of the things that they talk about is that they don't believe that God meant for them to be evangelical, for them to proselytize. Um, and yet we, we see over here that there were devout proselyte, proselytes even among these people. Um, and here, this, this is a direct quote out of Isaiah 42 and 40, 49. I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles that, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Scripture Prophetic scripture always has a current, contemporary fulfillment, and then it's got the, the future fulfillment typically in Christ. And so this was meant for them, you, you guys, you, the Jews, are, are that you should be salvation to the ends of the earth, that you should bring the word of the Lord. This kind of reminds me, if you think of it, of Luke 14, 23. Luke 24, then the master said to the servant, go out. Remember, this is, the master had, had made a big, a big party, had a lot of food, done it up, and went and invited lots of, lots of people. And one person wanted to wait for his father to be buried. One person just got married and wanted to, you know, spend some time with his wife. And you had they, all these excuses of why. And the master said, okay. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I, say to you, for I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper. So one thing that jumps out is, <laughs> we're the people from the highways and the byways and the hedges. <laughs> That's us. Oh, let the scruffies come, I guess. So uh helps keep us humble a bit. <laughs> Oops. Verse 48 and 49. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. We're not going to get too far in the, uh, 
that, that whole discussion. But um, I was having, I was having a, this. You know, this is this is a verse. Obviously, that's heavy on the on the sovereignty of God. The idea that He only those only those who are saved who He has decided only this person is a saved. Um, there's verses that kind of support both sides of that that argument, and I think. Th- so I, I have I have one one friend who's heavily Calvinistic, one friend who's heavily. Um, drawing a blank right now on the other side. Armenian. There we go. Sorry, heavily Armenian, and so they they're kind of arguing back and forth. My my point that you know, the the Calvary Chapel line the is always somewhere somewhere in the middle is really the the reality is that the Bible teaches this, and this, that the problem is not that the Bible is contradicting. The problem is we have a lack of understanding of. God and so we don't understand how we God has allowed us free will to choose and yet he has sovereignty to a point I don't understand that and so we we shouldn't it, it's good to argue and chew and amongst brothers and sisters who love the Lord who aren't going to be who aren't going to be uh, steer, steered away it's, it's okay to have those points and argues but and points and those arguments and go back and forth and, and, and iron sharpening iron. But end of the day, we've got to remember there's a whole lot that we don't understand about God. He's a huge, immense, powerful, awesome God that we're just scraping along with our wee little reasoning of this verse. And that, yes, these are true. God is sovereign and God is, and yet we have, he has given us a choice and how those where one ends and one begins, it's beyond what we're able to uh, to reason with our pea little brain. Verse 15 50 through 52, But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Life lesson, the Word and the Spirit produce a life of joy and disciples. They were all about the Word of God in this section. They went to this island and they were all about the Word of God, 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 and that's what they were about. And, fo- so fo- and yet they, they could not have been full of joy after being persecuted had they not been full of the Holy Spirit. So it's that, just like PD has been talking about, you know, an effective ch- church, an effective Christian is someone who loves the Word of God and is filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the, Without both, uh, our life does not work well. Without both, our life does not work well. The Word and the Spirit produce a life of joy in disciples. I'm going to share one quote. The happiness of a genuine Christian lies far beyond the reach of earthly disturbances and is not affected by the changes and chances to which mortal things are exposed. The martyrs were more happy in the flames than their persecutors could be in their beds of down. Adam Clark, this is... How do I say this? This is those who are who are walking well in the Spirit. Those who are um, drenched in in the Word and walking by the Spirit. That's that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there are not Christians who. I mean, I can I can tell you in my own life. There's plenty of days that that I'm that I'm affected by changes and chances that are going on. So let's let's be be real with one another and not set this thing that oh we can't obtain, but but when we are drenched in the word, when we are walking by the Spirit, we can walk in such a way that the that the circumstances and chances that happen in life don't rock us. They don't rock us. The word of God and the fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. 
God, for this uh, section of Scripture, God, that, that over and over and over reminds us of the importance of your word uh, in the salvation of people. God, I thank you for this place that is dedicated to the teaching of your word. God, I pray, Lord, for each of these men, God, that we would be dedicated to the learning of your word. Lord, that we, we would seek to be filled with your spirit, that we might be able to walk out in truth, in humbleness, um, what it is we learn, and God, that we would have a right perspective of you, that we would, we would fear you, not because of wrath to come, but because of who you are, because of how great you are. Lord, we thank you that you, you have justified us uh, and paid the penalty for our sin. And we don't have to fear wrath. But God, may we have the right perspective of who you are. God, I thank you for these men. I ask you, Lord, to, to bless them, to fill them with your Holy Spirit. Help them, help us, to help me, help us each, Lord, to be used by you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.